Good evening and welcome to the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion and Culture at the College of Our Lady of the Elms. I'm Dr. Peter DiPergola, Shauna's Family Chair for the Study of the Humanities and Executive Director of the St. Augustine Center. I have the distinct honor of hosting tonight's inaugural Distinguished Lecture in Ethics. Please note that tonight's event is being recorded and will be uploaded on the Elms College YouTube channel within the next few days. Immediately following tonight's lecture, there will be an opportunity to engage directly with our distinguished speaker. Please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please avoid using the chat box to submit questions. Before we begin tonight's historic event, let us take a moment to consciously place ourselves in the presence of God. To that end, it is now my pleasure to introduce Victor Ivansev, sophomore biology major, who will offer St. Thomas Aquinas's prayer for a good life. Grant, O merciful God, that I may ardently desire, carefully examine, truly know, and perfectly fulfill those things that are pleasing to you and to the praise and glory of your holy name. Direct my life, O my God and grant that I might know what you would have me to do and for me to fulfill it as is necessary and profitable to my soul. Grant to me, O Lord my God, that I may not be found wanting in prosperity or in adversity and that I may not be lifted up by one nor cast down by the other. May I find joy in nothing but what leads to you and sorrow in nothing but what leads away from you. May I seek to please no one or fear to displease anyone save only you. Give me a steadfast heart that no tribulation may shatter and a free heart that no violent affection may claim as its own. And finally, grant me, O Lord my God, a mind to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you. Give life pleasing to you, perseverance to trust and await you in confidence that I shall embrace you at last. Amen. Thank you, Victor, for that beautiful centering prayer. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 11th president of the College of Our Lady of the Elms, Dr. Harry Dumay. Dr. Dumay has served in higher education for over 20 years. Prior to joining Elms College, he held senior and executive level positions with St. Anselm College, Harvard University's Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, Boston College's Graduate School of Social Work, in Boston University's School of Engineering. Dr. Dumay serves on various boards, including the New England Commission for Higher Education, the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in Massachusetts, the Association of Colleges of the Sisters of St. Joseph, the Boston Foundation's Haiti Development Institute, Pope Francis Preparatory School, Build Health International in Norwich University. Please join me in welcoming President Dumay. Thank you, Dr. Dupergola. And thank you, Victor, for this very nice invocation. Good evening, everyone. It is my true delight to welcome all of you here virtually to the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture's inaugural Distinguished Lecture in Ethics. Now, we know that there could be a number of competing priorities uh, calling your interest on a beautiful spring evening. So we truly appreciate your being here with us. Now let me begin by thanking everyone, particularly those who worked behind the scenes to make this evening's event possible. The dedicated advisory board for the Center for Ethics, Religion and Culture, faculty, staff, and members of the community. A special thanks to our three generous foundational donors who've helped to take the center from a concept to a reality, from a seed to a plant which is now beginning to bear fruits, such as this evening's lecture. I'm deeply grateful to Professor James F. Keenan of the Society of Jesus for accepting to deliver this inaugural lecture and for choosing such an apt topic. Father Keenan, I am very much looking forward to enjoying your remarks 
and I thank you for being with us this evening. <clears throat> the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities has created a pamphlet in which it describes the core principles of the Catholic intellectual tradition, which it defines as, quote, this accumulating and ever growing tradition of knowledge that continuous, continually evolves to engage current developments in thought and relevant discoveries in science, art, language, and culture in the effort to link them to eternal truth, end quote. The ACCU is keenly aware that Catholic higher education institutions, uh, we have this dual mission. We share in the common enterprise and the common purpose of higher learning that originated from the Middle Ages. On top of that, we are also the heirs of a particular type of intellectual inquiry, one that is shaped by Catholic values. According to the ACCU, quote, it offers a holistic, historical, and ethical perspective to the professions. It helps to consider universal truths about beauty, the created world, and human purpose in light of revelation, end quote. So the Catholic intellectual tradition, therefore, is not static. It remains current with the dynamism and evolution of our, of our times, dynamism and evolution that brings with it messiness and imperfection but it helps make sense of the messiness of modern and contemporary life by holding it against transcendent and universal truths. I think that this is very much an apropos description of the work that the Elms St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion and Culture aims to accomplish by looking at elements of our culture and examining them against sound principles of ethics elements of our Catholic faith and interfaith traditions. This effort is well exemplified by tonight, tonight's lecture, Finding God in the Twin Pandemics. The greatest generation lived through the Great Depression and fought World War II. Our time is also marked by tremendous challenges two of which are the worldwide catastrophe of the COVID-19 pandemic and the enduring scourge of racism. How we respond to these twin pandemics will define our country and the globe for generations to come. If the COVID pandemic brought all of humanity together against the common foe, racism has for centuries now Fitted groups of human beings against one another under the premise that some groups have more dignity and worth than others. And this is not theoretical. It has been made real through perversely well-crafted policies. And we see the evidence of it every day in the disparities in education, health, housing, finances, in all other aspects of American life. We are reminded of the facts about both COVID-19 and racism every time that we turn on our TVs, look at social media, or open a newspaper. The twin pandemics are very real, and in fact, they are much linked. Quite fittingly, one of the nine tenets of the Catholic intellectual tradition is the dignity of the human person. Quote, at the heart of this principle is the recognition that every human being has intrinsic value and worth, regardless of their stage in life, vocation in society, or physical or mental ability, end quote. What is the role of higher education and of university ethics in the face of these big social threats? We've traditionally thought of our institutions as a space for the inculcation of democratic values, ideals, and processes as a rehearsal space for democracy. The Association of Governing Board states that, quote, from Cicero to Thomas Jefferson to John Dewey, education historically has been understood to be essential to the cultivation of civic virtues 
and habits of mind that characterize citizenship in a democratic society, end quote. What is the role of the university when democracy is grotesquely distorted as something that actively excludes groups of people? This lecture tonight provides us a great opportunity to ponder these questions. And it compels us to look into a mirror and ask what role is Elms College, a Catholic higher education institution, called to play in addressing those social problems? How have we faced the challenges brought about by COVID-19? How are we reckoning with the issues of racial injustice? How do we live up to our ideal of encouraging our students to affect positive change in the community and the world. We are rightfully proud of our legacy of following in the footsteps of women who believe in social justice. Every member of the Elms College community knows that, that that's why the sisters founded Elms College. Tonight's lecture offers us another opportunity to examine how we're furthering our founding mission. So once again, I thank Father Keenan for being here with us. And I thank all of you for participating in this inaugural lecture in ethics at the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture. Thank you, Dr. Jume, for those moving uh, and powerful remarks. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Walter Bro. Thank you very much, Dr. DePergola and Dr. DeMay. Thank you very much as well. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would also like to add my thanks for everyone who's attending this evening, and certainly my thanks to Father Keenan for being the inaugural speaker in our St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture Distinguished Lecture in Ethics series. As we all look back at the year 2020 and the first months of 2021, the challenges were many, so much so that many found themselves overwhelmed. Elms College as an institution of higher education understood our primary responsibility during the pandemic was to continue to provide opportunities for our students to learn while working to ensure the health and safety of the entire Elms community. Allowing our students to continue to learn and discover the truth, guided by the mission and values of the Elms and the culture of social justice and ethics that is the essence of the charism of our founders, the Sisters of St. Joseph, was at our core. We also knew that the Elms could not stand still and wait for the pandemic to pass, but needed to continue to look into the future and think strategically about where we want to be post-COVID. We continued to finalize our strategic plan, receiving final approval by the Board of Trustees last October, we continue to develop high impact academic programs from our areas of excellence, including the Center for Ethics, Religion and Culture. We switched teaching and learning to a hybrid modality that we call Elms Flex, giving students the flexibility to attend classes in person or remotely. We improved instructional technology in classrooms. We help teachers, uh, faculty be better instructors in this new hybrid learning modality. And we also appointed Dr. DePergola as the founding executive director of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture as we formally launched the center last fall. And not surprising, Dr. DePergola hit the ground running. To connect to the Elms in the greater community as an academic institution, we had our obligation to continue to provide opportunities for learning at the highest levels. From the CERC, there will be the Reverend Hugh Korean lecture on theology taking place next month. And certainly tonight's inaugural distinguished lecture in ethics, the first major program from the CERC this spring. With the vaccination rates for COVID uh, increasing and state restrictions being loosened, I think this is a perfect time for Father Keenan's address, helping us to reflect back on the past year and to start to look at the future with optimism. I cannot think of a more relevant and significant topic for this time now than reflecting on the impact of the pandemic, as well as the events that re-sparked the Black Lives Matter movement last year through the lens of finding God 
and through the lens of the role of colleges and universities in searching for and shining a light on truth. Dr. Keenan, thank you again for being here this evening. I, as I'm sure we all are, are very much looking forward to hearing your reflection and your remarks this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bro, for your remarks. Since the late 11th century, the university has served as a scholastic clearinghouse that unites otherwise disparate individuals together in the common pursuit of addressing fundamental ethical, religious, and cultural issues related to identity, responsibility, and meaning. The COVID-19 pandemic has radically altered the ability of students to join together with their peers and professors alike in the effort to seek answers to these formative questions. And the Black Lives Matter movement has underscored the need for universities to address and close the widening gap of structural racism and racial inequities on campuses locally and abroad. In light of the twin pandemics plaguing university students, faculty and staff across the globe, it is more critical than ever to revisit and re-examine the role that the university has to play in healing the various infections viral and social alike, affecting the health and dignity of the communities they serve. Against this backdrop, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, Reverend James S. F. Keenan, S.J. Professor Keenan is Vice Provost for Global Engagement, the Kinesius Professor of Theology and Director of the Jesuit Institute at Boston College. A Jesuit priest since 1982, he received his licentiate and doctorate from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, Italy. Dr. Keenan has edited or written 25 books and published over 400 essays, articles, and reviews. As founder of Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church, he chaired the international conferences in Padua, Trento, and Sarajevo. In addition to Boston College, he has taught at Fordham University, John Carroll University, the Ateneo de Manila, Dharmarum in Bangalore, and at his alma mater, the Gregorian University. Reverend Keenan recently wrote University Ethics, How Colleges Can Build and Benefit from a Culture of Ethics, and has just finished editing two books, Building Bridges in Sarajevo, the Plenary Papers of Sarajevo, and Street Homelessness in Catholic Theological Ethics. He is presently writing another book, which will come as no surprise to those who know him, A Brief History of Catholic Ethics. In spring 2009, while a graduate student in the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College, I had the immense privilege of being a graduate student in Professor Keenan, Keenan's course co-taught with the late biblical scholar, Reverend Daniel J. Harrington, SJ, titled Paul in Virtue Ethics. At that time, I remember sitting on the edge of my seat in a large classroom in Gasson Hall to hear what Professor Keenan would say next. His reflections on the moral significance of mercy, the willingness, he told us, to enter into the chaos of another were profound. 12 years later, not much has changed. While no longer in Gasson Hall, I remain on the edge of my seat tonight. Please join me in extending the warmest possible welcome to Reverend James F. Keenan of the Society of Jesus, who will deliver the inaugural Distinguished Lecture in Ethics on the topic of finding God in the twin pandemics, theological reflections on the role of the university in the age of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Peter. It's very good to see you. Um, and I'm very grateful for this invitation. Uh, President Dumay, Vice President Bro, I'd like to also thank you for your very kind and gracious words um, that you've offered. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing what you think of what I'm about to say. Uh, I wanna tell you one thing. Uh, in the beginning about my conversations with Dr. P the Pergola, 
um, we began to talk about university ethics. And the more I worked on this paper, the more I decided I wanted to make sure that the university was not too confident. So I decided to return to university ethics. This is a, a book that I did a while ago. I don't know if you can see it, um, but uh, I decided that I wanted to do an, uh, a paper that would say that just as our societies are vulnerable, um, just as hospitals are vulnerable, so too the university is vulnerable, but it's touching that vulnerability that's key. So I'm going to begin with a bit on university ethics as to why I think it's good to remind the university that it has enormous challenges and that as it tries to address both COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, that it will be by actually tapping those challenges that it will best serve uh, both the church and the world. So I'm going to proceed to five points. The first point is going to be on university ethics. Then I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19. Then I'm going to introduce two separate topics. One is on vulnerability and one is on recognition. I'll be using scriptural texts to be talking about how we can discern God's finger, God's light, God's revelation to us. And then I want to conclude on Black Lives Matter. So I'm, we're going to cover a lot of territory, but I've told Dr. DePagola that I hope to be done in 45 minutes so that I can get at least 20 minutes of questions from all of you. So I'm very happy to be here and on it. Let me begin. Five years ago, I published a book, University Ethics, How Colleges Can Build and Benefit from a Culture of Ethics. I would like to share with you how I came to the topic, why I think the university needs ethics, why it avoids ethics, and how we can begin to overcome the obstacles to building a culture of ethics. In 2002, the Boston sexual abuse scandal broke. And as a priest teaching theological ethics in Boston, I found myself immediately caught up in the scandal. One of the first lessons that we learned from the scandals was that though the churches taught ethics to its parishioners, it never trained its own administrators nor its clergy and lay ministers in professional ethics. Though it taught ethics to others, it did not practice it because it did not believe that it needed ethics. It presumed if it could teach it, it did not need it. During the sexual abuse crisis, this absence of a culture of ethics in the church became crystal clear. Ethics was not only lacking obviously among the predatory priest, but it was also noticeably absent in the decision-making by bishops and their counselors as they transferred such priests as they failed to notify civil authorities, as they stonewalled and defamed reputations of concerned and aggrieved parents, and as they left children at profound risk. Ethics was also not evident even after the harm was done. As the crisis unfolded, innocent priests were not protected, due process was often breached, financial mismanagement frequently occurred, lay initiatives were treated with scorn, derision, and suspicion and priests who protested Episcopal mismanagement became targeted. Why was ethics so absent? Why did not anyone in clerical or Episcopal life so rarely ask of their decisions and their practices the simple question, is this ethical? Did they have the language, structure, and practices to even ask, let alone answer the question, but is this ethical? Unlike many other professions, religious leaders were never trained in ethics pertaining to works and matters in their field. In seminary, we were trained in sexual ethics, social ethics, and medical ethics. We were trained to teach and preach ethics to the congregation, to those who are married, to those in medicine, business, politics, or law. Not only were we not taught ethics in matters about sexual and personal boundaries in our own lives, but also we were not taught on matters about financial responsibility, personal and social accountability, the claims of confidentiality, the importance of truth telling, due process, consultation, contracts, fair wages, delations, adequate representation, appeals, conflicts of interest, et cetera. Thus, when religious clergy and bishops exercise routine decision-making, they turn to a multitude of considerations, but articulated ethical norms their specific values and virtues and goods, 
and the type of critical thinking that estimates the long-standing social claims that these values, goods, and virtues have on us were not in any way explicitly professionally engaged during the scandal. In effect, this question, but is it ethical, was absent in the churches. Today, as the church continues to emerge from its scandals, it is, not only, it is only beginning to learn that the professional ethics of its ministers and other employees does not inhibit or compromise the mission of the church, but rather supports its credibility, its community building activity, and its teaching and realization of the truth. Years ago, in a major work, Yale University's Wayne Meeks stated simply, making morals means making community. This insight runs throughout this inaugural lecture because raising ethical questions about the university will not inhibit or compromise the work of the university. Rather, ethics is constitutive of human flourishing an insight that Aristotle and St. Paul tried to teach time and again. 10 years ago, after writing and editing several books on church ethics, I began wondering about that other institution that teaches ethics, the university. I began looking at newspapers to see if there were any university scandals. What I found were many scandals, but not anyone calling them ethical ones. Our universities are riddled with ethical compromise, but rarely, even when the press exposes something shameful about a university, do we identify the issue as a lack of ethics. Still, every morning I found something about a university athlete, a development scheme, a campus sexual assault, cheating scandals, a trustee member's conflict of interest, or an adjunct faculty member's poor treatment. Every day I could find something that suggested that university ethical scandals were a commonplace. Living as I do in a Jesuit community with three other ethicists, John Paris, David Hollenbach, and Ken Himes, they too began scanning the newspapers. I would come down, I'm a late riser, I would come down um, for breakfast, deluged by the other three with reports from all over. Did you see the cheating scandal at Harvard? Did you see about the academic fraud at UNC? What about those rape allegations at UVA? Or the settlement at University of Colorado? The hazing death at Florida A&M? The firing of the president and the football coach at Penn State? The pepper spraying of students at the University of California at Davis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I began wondering, are these issues sensational but isolated moments across the academic landscape? Or is there something more systemic here? I came to believe it was systemic. In other forms of professional life, we have long recognized a strong connection between the lack of a professional ethics in a particular institutional setting and the lack of an ethical consciousness in that culture. I believe that the absence of a professional ethics is evidence of and symptomatic of a culture interested in ethics. And that's why I applaud this evening that the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religions and Cultures uh, can be a presence precisely for this reason, among others. Simply put, our universities do not believe that they need ethics. Like the church, they seem to sense that if they can teach ethics, they don't need ethics. Still, this is odd. We can certainly acknowledge that at any university, anyone, can take a course on business ethics, or nursing ethics, or legal ethics, or medical ethics, or journalistic ethics. Ethics courses in the different professions are easily available at almost any university. In fact, generally speaking, if one is looking for ethical training in a profession, the courses are found at a university. The one major professional institution about which you cannot find any ethics courses listed among the hundreds of courses at any university is precisely the university. If you search for a course on university ethics, you will simply not find one. Though professors and their deans recognize the need to teach professional ethics in all their other professions, they show no real interest in professional ethics for their own profession. Most of all, administrators, all due respect, 
administrators in particular, those at the highest level of the university from vice presidents and the president to the board of trustees normally have not been trained in professional university ethics. Small wonder then that they do not promote a culture of ethical consciousness and accountability. My claim that the university has no evident interest in ethics cannot be addressed by simply developing a code of conduct for professors, students, coaches, admissions offices, and the rest. Before we ever articulate a professional code of conduct for each community within the university, I think we need to develop a culture of awareness among faculty, staff, and administrators and students that for the university to flourish, it needs to recognize the integral constitutive role of ethics in the formation of, uh, of, a, of a flourishing community. Let me just give you some ideas of what I'm talking about. None of us, nor our colleagues throughout the academy are really trained to be ethical in the standards we use for grading papers, for seeing students, for maintaining office hours, for evaluating colleagues or prospective hires. We have not been taught anything about professional confidentiality, boundaries with our students, writing letters of evaluation for and about others, or even about keeping our contracts. We have not addressed the fact that our salaries are disproportionate or that tenure decisions sometimes lack some objectivity. We do not have professional questions about our university investments, about budgets or boards of trustees, nor do we review adequately fellow faculty after tenure or after being given endowed chairs. It's, it's, it's really true that after you get tenure or worse or better, an endowed chair, you're not much subject to review. That is like sustainability on campuses, faculty or staff unions, university relations with neighbors, students' rights, sexual health issues, board of trustees, terms of office, conflict of interest laws, workers' benefits, immigration issues, racial tensions the dorm life of students, the overemphasis on research and the failure to reward good teaching, or the harm of classism experienced by many working class students unable to keep up with the cost of education might occasionally garner an individual faculty member's attention. But for the most part, we leave that to academic administrators who are trying to answer these things on their own, but no one doing any work in ethics and how it pertains to solutions toward these matters. Our accountability at a university is fundamentally vertical. It's to our chairs and deans, but not to one another, certainly not to our students, not to the university community, and not to stipulated community standards. Instead, like the clergy, we mind our own business, we faculty, for instance, for the most part, and make few claims and lay fewer expectations on one another. Let me conclude one compelling example of the lack of any interest in university ethics, the cataloging of books on professional ethics in university libraries. And here I offer what I found in my own university library six years ago, but it's basically the same today, only proportionately slightly different. We have a million books stacked in our library. There, each book is assigned a subject heading. Under the subject medical ethics, we have 1,321 books on medical ethics. Under business ethics, we have 599 books. Under nursing ethics, we have 234 books. Under legal ethics, we have 129 books. And under clergy ethics, we have, fortunately, a relatively new 25 books. But under university ethics, there are five. This one and four others. And I know each of them, but most people don't. This lack of book on books on academic ethics is alarming in as much as academics, more than business people, nurses, doctors, and lawyers develop their careers precisely by writing books. Our metier and promotional mantra is publish or perish. While we publish books on professional ethics in other fields, we apparently have very little interest in the field of professional university ethics. Concomitantly, just as we do not write books on the topic, we do not teach the courses either, but then none of us seem to be aware of that. I develop a number of issues about university ethics, but here let me conclude raising two issues, two matters that I see as obstacles that keep us from being a community and therefore keep us from being vulnerable in a sense of being capacious and becoming ethical. And those two issues are first, the isolating individualistic world of the faculty, 
and the fiefdoms of so-called university departments. Unlike most professionals and civil servants, we university faculty function very much as individuals in the academy. Aside from department meetings, we study alone, work alone, teach alone, write alone, and lecture alone. Look at me. We also grade students individually and write their singular letters of recommendation. We cannot underestimate the individualism of our scholarly formation and our professional lifestyle. While almost every contemporary professional works in some form of partnership or teamwork, police officers with their partners, firefighters with their ladder companies, healthcare workers with their team and lawyers with their firm, we faculty train alone and then work virtually alone. Think of the dissertation. Whether the field of work requires its professional formation to be at least five years of working alone on one's own project with the last two years spent effectively in solitary confinement. Why is this, the highest expression of academic wisdom, so individualistic and so isolationist? Someone might say, yes, but there is mentoring. However, even the relationality and the mentoring is not terribly thick. How many hours during those four, five, or six years, that's 35,040 hours, 43,800 hours, or 52,560 hours, four, five, or six years, do the advisor and mentee actually see and sit with one another? Is it at all analogous to any other professional relationship where juniors literally shadow their mentor? Certainly, many faculty have great relationships with a variety of members of the university. My argument is, however, that professionally speaking, there is not a structure that promotes those relationships. Teaching, grading, and mentoring is measured against singular professionals, but it's not in those areas of university work that we are standalone individuals. Think, for instance, of office hours. What other professional corporate life lets their employees come to work whenever they want to? Other than the classes we teach and the occasional monthly department meetings we may attend, most faculty can choose to arrive for any office hours we want. Not only are we free to name our office hours, but there is rarely any expectation to host office hours during any specific time that would be convenient to others. By office hours, we are required to be available to another person, presumably a student in need. Yet we can set those hours whenever we want and rarely are we required to be there in the office for more than four or five, five hours a week. What other professional has such autonomy? Note, I'm not suggesting that faculty have only four hours a week. With teaching, letters of recommendation, publishing, and other academic demands, many faculty have a full week of work. But that work is on our time, our place, and usually, again, alone. Hardly any other modern professional works that way. Still, we should be able to see that if individual faculty take the initiative to enter into practices of solidarity with others, this could lead to the possibility of developing and sustaining an ethical community within the university. When faculty collaborate in research with others, when they elect to join a seminar, when they volunteer to be on a university committee, when they offer to be a faculty advisor to a student club, or they host their class at home with a meal, they enter into relationships that make possible the community. But these turns to the practice of solidarity of themselves turns to ethical practices. With ethics, community can flourish. Without ethics, the community breaks down. Universities are also impacted by the social contours of the university that do not foster community friendship or solidarity, but rather departmentalizes personal groupings routinely. Faculty, plant managers, cafeteria workers, student affairs deans, Financial aid offices, admissions boards, coaches, custodial workers, trustee members, campus ministers, university police, and librarians each have their own definable departments, and their members know mostly what happens within those departments. Rarely are there occasions to go beyond one's domain except when they go to university sporting events. The university might think of itself as a community, but it's at best a very thin one. Any reading of the literature on the life of the university tells us that the university structure is very clear in its vertical direction. Each university knows without a doubt who answers to whom in the upwardly oriented structure of a unilateral accountability. The university horizontally is not terribly clear, however, because its terrain is defined by departments unto themselves. The university horizontal structure is best understood, I believe, as fiefdoms. 
a perfect description of the university inasmuch as both are deeply rooted in the medieval world. I believe that the university stemming as it does from that era is affected structurally by its roots. Not only does its hierarchical structure make its accountability flow unilaterally and singularly vertical, but it also inherits the geography of fiefdoms that hinder matters not only of accountability and transparency, but also of relationality, distributive justice, and the common good. Universities are organized by departments, a structure that gives the suggestion that each department shares something in common with another department. But given the hierarchical structures of the university, such a shared identity functions less in the operations and more in the purported mission design. Departments are part of the fiefdom structure, in part because higher level administrators can treat departments differently without others in other departments knowing any differently. In fact, in many ways, these administrators function as feudal lords. Life within the department is determined much less by what happens in other departments as by what happens between senior administrators in that department. At universities, at least the administrator knows that knowledge is power. Fiefdoms are not only seen in the academic sector, but in the student affairs life as well. Just as faculty might not know the student's personal conduct, neither the student affairs know the student's academic life. Similarly, health and counseling services, development, alumni relations, athletics, dining services, and many other departments function separately and are accountable to, a different, to the different university managers who make their own assessments according to their specific domains criteria. In short, the standards, communications, and information of each domain are not set across the university itself, but are particular to and remain within the domain of that particular fiefdom. It is for this reason that the only two constituencies who know what occurs across the university are the clients, that is the students and the president. In terms of ethics, this is fairly problematic because as we know from Aristotle, there is some relationship between the polis or the actual community and the common good that makes possible human flourishment. That is to the extent that members of the polis as a society participate in and contribute to the common good, there is human flourishment. But at the university, the players on the ground do not see a coherency in the, in the community nor an operative notion of the good. So this is basically my trying to make you all very uncomfortable about believing that the university can do much because I think that's good. I think that trying to name reality as it is, is exactly what, and even to darken it, if you will, as I'm doing, um, is actually what we've been learning through COVID-19. What, what I will now go into is with COVID-19, how COVID-19 has been the great revealer of how things are, and that in, in, in helping us to see that, it has caused us to have a new humility and a new vulnerability and so I decided I didn't want us to be in a university all sitting there going, yeah, look at the rest of the world. I wanna say our home institution itself has problems. And that as we try to respond to critical contemporary issues, let us not think that we're the problem solver. Let us realize that we participate in a community that's trying to build itself up after these two pandemics as we're ca calling them tonight. So enter COVID-19. In an article entitled, Being Human in the Time of COVID-19, the theologian Johann Albrecht Melan writes from Pretoria, South Africa, describing in part the novel situation in which we find ourselves. He writes that this is the first time in the history of humanity that such drastic global lockdown measures have been taken and that governments have taken the conscious decisions to lay lame their economies. Such a radical decision is truly novel. Besides the economic lockdown, there are numerous socioeconomic repercussions. He proposes that, quote, COVID-19 maybe challenges what being human means, or at least what one has come to believe uh, concerning the meaning of being human. Entertaining what Malin calls the novelty of COVID-19 and its impact on what being human is, I want to say that COVID, as an interruption, has forced us to recognize a particular question about humanity. And that question is, how are we doing? I think this is a question that leads to an even more provocative and disturbing question that concerns human progress. Have we really progressed as well as we thought? 
Have we advanced as much as it seems we thought we had? The question is particularly terrifying for those whose lives depend on the needed advances of human progress. The 60 million people in transit on our globe, those most unmoored by the catastrophic and yet worsening environmental events of the past 40 years. How are we doing on this planet? For decades, we have been presuming that there has been human progress. Globalization has given us the impression that we are interconnected. Transportation and commerce coupled with tra travel and great communi communications suggested that we were becoming a global community, even a global family. Advances in medicine, in particular in cancer, gave us assurances that we were moving ahead. Though all the time we were ignoring the fact that illnesses that affected poorer people like malaria and tuberculosis could be subdued, but were not. We simply failed to recognize what we had left undone. In similar ways, now for years, the harm that fossil fuels bring to our environment and, and, and knowing that a sword of Damocles has hung not over our heads, but over our children's head and their children's heads, but still we persisted in the belief of human progress, all the time failing to bother to recognize that we have been compromising the future of our progeny. And when it came to diversity on matters of race, gender, sexuality, and ethnicity, we also believe, enjoyed the belief that we were well, progressing well. This question of human progress is important for us as Catholics. More than 50 years ago, in a, in a stellar encyclical called Progressio Populorum, Pope Paul VI promulgated the argument that human progress was constitutively tied to the development of peoples. The global South could not remain isolated, alienated, or marginalized. The industrialized North could not proceed as if unrelated to the rest of humanity. We were and are deeply interdependent. Our destinies are not separate, but interwoven. But COVID-19 has interrupted human progress and has found us lacking. Though our interdependency is evident in terms of our vulnerability to the virus, it definitely has not been in evidence in terms of our ability to respond to it. Above all, the interruption has laid bare astonishing inequities that completely compromise any understanding of human progress that we might have enjoyed. Inequities are everywhere. They are stunningly apparent in the US where racial, ethnic, class divisions are exposed by the way the virus attacks those most alienated from the common good of our society. Now, those who were never able to harvest adequately our so-called common good are harvesting the virus. In America, COVID-19 has exposed our shame. In fact, inequities are a cause of the spread of the virus, meaning that were our world not so marked by inequity, the virus could be more easily and effectively contained. Witness, for instance, the lack of global interconnectedness in the pursuit of the vaccine. Instead of progressive interdependency and transparency, we find the great design of interdependency tattered outside the labs of research. Google, for instance, the word vaccinations, and you will quickly discover that the virus has impeded our own, inability, our own ability universally to vaccinate our children for childhood diseases. That's, that's what comes up first, is the history of the inability to address childhood diseases through vaccinations. Secondly, second to that, we find that World Health Organizations are concerned about the overwhelmingly competitive as opposed to the cooperative search for a COVID vaccine. Herein are concerns not only about who will find, the first, find it first, but who will be last, left last to access the vaccine. I, we've seen that, that people are talking about years before people in other parts of the world will have a vaccine. Many of us are wondering about getting it within a week or a month. In other places of the world, we're talking about years. Why is that? Have we learned something here? The great interruption has revealed a great contradiction. It is not how far we have advanced, but how far we have slid. Not how far we progress, but how much opportunity we have lost. Here let us consider the final contradiction, women in the pandemic. A recent essay informs us that a full 70% of global healthcare workers are women, but they are only 25% 
of the senior profession, positions among healthcare professionals. In fact, they are universally chronically underpaid and are not adequately covered in their care of those infected by the virus. Gender equity, a true marker for human progress, is shamefully further away than we thought. Worse, women and children are now in lockdown, more who are now in lockdown are more at risk and more victimized by violence and sexual assault than ever. Why are these women who are the more generous most at risk? Now I could go on to the issue of sexuality, reminding you how poorly we are doing there by thinking, for instance, of the, how the Vatican decided how it too wanted to add its response to the simple issue of blessing same-sex unions or marriages. But let me turn to another topic, vulnerability. The philosopher and economist and president of the Colombian Truth Commission, now overseeing the reconciliation between the government and rebels of Colombia. So in the country of Colombia, there's been this great civil strife between these rebels and the government. And there's a Jesuit there who's the president of the Colombian Truth Commission, his name is Francisco de Ro. And he provides us with a worthy response to the situation we, which we find ourselves. He emphasized how surprising it is that we are so vulnerable, and yet that vulnerability is not something to escape, but rather something to embrace. From a much lengthier text, from a lengthier text, I take some of his key observations. He first surprises the world before the interruption of COVID-19. He reminds us what the powers that be were thinking in January 2020, only 14, only 15 months ago. He writes, we believed ourselves invincible. We were going to quadruple world production in the next three decades. In 2021, we would have the highest growth so far this century. We killed though 2000 species per year. We had established as moral that good is everything that increases capital and bad is what decreases it. And governments and armies looked after money but not happiness. Then came the pandemic's interruption. The coronavirus, he writes, removed us from the illusion of being gods. We are confused and humiliated watching the real numbers of the infected and the dead rise, and we don't know what to do. You can see Germany today has great turmoil right now with whether they should have a lockdown at Easter or not. They flip-flopped three times so far, just in the past 48 hours. He argues, however, that these lessons of our failures are actually keys to the future. He prescribes, living with the grandeur of vulnerability is living authentically in solidarity and interdependence because through it, we understand that we are all carried by each other, protected by each other. Vulnerability leads us to include others without believing ourselves superior. That's why I wanted to talk about the university. We can't think of ourselves as superior. We have to think of ourselves as integral. He concludes, we need the determinations to move forward in the knowledge of our own fragility, the need we have for each other, the meaning of authentic dignity, which exists only if its conditions are provided to everyone, the viability of what seemed impossible to us, generosity, solidarity, and beyond justice, reconciliation and forgiveness courage to live in a state of vulnerability. Vulnerability is a key response by many who are reflecting right now globally on both who we are in light of the pandemic, that is descriptively, how are we doing? We're very vulnerable, but also who we ought to be in light of the pandemic, that is the normative, that's the ethical question, that is what we ought to be. And the same answer is given, we ought to be vulnerable. The answer to both questions is the same, vulnerability. That's my message tonight. Because the word, word has a very complex function, we need to understand how people like Durow and others are using the word vulnerability. One of my favorite philosophers is Judith Butler, who realized that we had a problem with identifying vulnerability as being in need. If being vulnerable meant being in need, then people who should respond to those in need should be invulnerable, dominant, or anything but vulnerable. Butler insisted that vulnerability was not primarily about being in need, but 
but about the capacity to respond. Vulnerable people are able to hear the call of the other. Vulnerability is not first about weakness or neediness, but about availability. This is precisely why people who suffer want to be accompanied by vulnerable people. They know that vulnerable people appreciate their predicament. In short, if we want to respond to the other in need, we have to be vulnerable. We have to overcome a common misunderstanding of the word. Some people believe that the word vulnerable means being or having been wounded, but that is not what the word means. To be vulnerable means to have the capacity to be wounded, the capacity to be exposed, the capacity to be at risk, and above all, the capacity to be responsive to others. That is, in being responsive to others, I am willing to be wounded. That's what vulnerable means. I'm willing to be wounded for the sake of being responsive to the other. To illustrate this newer understanding of vulnerability, let us turn to a few parables. First, the Good Samaritan. By asking who is the vulnerable one in that story, the wounded man or the Good Samaritan? The question is worth one for our investigation this evening. Before we start, let us remember that there is an overlooked trick by Jesus in the parable. In the answer to the question, who is my neighbor, right? This is the whole setup of it. Jesus is asked, what is the commandment? And we're told that it's love God, love your neighbor, and love uh, your neighbor as yourself. He's asked, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus leads us to think at the start that my neighbor is the wounded one on the road. Yet at the end, we realize that the neighbor is the one who showed mercy. We think of neighbor first as an object of concern, but then realize at the end that it is the subject who responds. By the end of the parable, the vulnerable agency of the Samaritan becomes the model for neighbor. Vulnerability appears to switch in the parable in much the same way that the neighbor does. They function much the same. The vulnerable one lays on the road, but he is passed by by two invulnerable people, dominant in save, solving all the big problems of their day, yet unable to recognize the man they pass by. Only the Samaritan is vulnerable to the wounded man. Only the Samaritan is capacious to recognize and respond to the wounded man. In a memorable text, Judith Butler describes being vulnerable as the foundational human capacity for being a neighbor. She writes, you call upon me and I answer. But if I answer, it was only because I was already answerable. That is, this susceptibility and vulnerability constitutes me at the most fundamental level. And it's there, we might say, prior to any deliberate decision to answer the call. In other words, one has to be already capable of receiving the call before actually answering it. That's what the Good Samaritan does. He hears the call of the man wounded on the road. In this sense, ethical responsibility, Butler writes, presupposes ethical responsiveness. This notion of vulnerability then describes not only those at risk, but more importantly, the human condition. The humanist challenge is to develop and hone our vulnerability. If we do not, we lose our humanity, like the priest and the Levite. Theologically, Butler's natural created answerableness resonates with a variety of creation narratives that capture the vulnerability of the human. I don't know how many of you have read this, but there's a wonderful book out there called The Once and Future King uh, by not a theologian, just a good storyteller called T.H. White, The Once and Future King. I recommend it. And in it, The Once and Future King, um, T.H. White provides an account of creation that captures vulnerability beautifully. And this is on the sixth day of creation. This is the account. On the sixth day of creation, God gathers all the embryos that God has created of each and every species of animal life. And he's in the big kingdom hall and all these embryos, they all look alike. They're all bouncing, they're all wobbling all over the place. They are all slushy. They're all kind of, you know, like preformed, if you will. 
And God then offers each embryo the opportunity to ask for an addition that will distinguish their species. The giraffe embryo says that it wants a long neck for tree food. The porcupine asks for quills for protection. And so it goes for the entire animal kingdom, the entire sixth day of creation. Each one gets distinguishing marks that give them something added. The last embryo is Adam, the human, who when asked by God what Adam wants responds, I think that you made me in the shape which I now have for reasons best known to yourselves and that it would be rude to change. I will stay a defenseless embryo all my life. God is delighted and lets the human embryo have no particular protection to be the most vulnerable of all newborns and says, as for you, Adam, you will look like an embryo till they bury you. White's vision of the human embryo as the bearer of human vulnerability is remarkable because behind that decision is the assumption that we are made in God's image and that if we are vulnerable, so is God. And White therefore concludes his account with God telling the human this, Adam, eternally undeveloped, you will always remain potential in our image, able to see some of our sorrows and to feel some of our joys. We are partly sorry for you, Adam, but partly hopeful. Human dignity rooted in the image of God participates in the vulnerability of God. This insight of our vulnerability being connected to God's resonates with the late Enda McDonough's work, a dear friend of mine who died two weeks ago, vulnerable uh, work that he called vulnerable to the holy in faith, morality, and art. There he begins his treatment on vulnerability with God. God reveals to us God's self as vulnerable by the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, his life in Nazareth, and his death on Golgotha. Sounding like white, McDonough writes that to be made in God's image is to be made vulnerable. Our dignity is rooted in God's vulnerability. I believe that that call to vulnerability is a call well heard on our campuses. Vulnerability could help make faculty more open to one another, more connected to our students. Vulnerability could prompt campuses to be less siloed, less departmentalized, more unified more communal, more ethical. Vulnerability is the key trajectory toward that end. Let me move to the next word, recognition. Recognition depends on vulnerability. We cannot recognize the other unless we are vulnerable. Think of the inability of the priest and the Levite who pass by the wounded man in the Good Samaritan parable. The lack of vulnerability means that there was no capacity to recognize. They didn't recognize because they were not vulnerable. What makes the Good Samaritan neighbor is that he was not only vulnerable to the man, but that he responded to him by doing what the other two did not, and that is to recognize him on the road. In recognizing him, they be he began the process of mercy, which as Dr. Uh, Pergola uh, defined uh, the way I do, uh, uh, mercy is the willingness to enter into the chaos of another. The process of mercy begins once the Good Samaritan recognizes the man on the road. Failing to recognize in the first place seems to be the prominent failure in human history. At least it appears that way in the Bible because Jesus's parables are often about failure to recognize. People do not fail in the gospels by what they have been, by the way they have been responding. Rather they fail beforehand. They fail to bother to recognize and respond in the first place. Nobody gets in trouble for messing things up. What they get in trouble is for not thinking of doing anything in the first place. The priest and the Levite pass by the man on the road. The goats in Matthew 25 don't see the hungry and the naked and the homeless. Or the rich man fails to recognize Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 to 31. None of these, and there are many others, recognize their neighbor in need. Yet recognition is the very first response of the vulnerable person. And when we talk about recognition, it's Black Lives Matter that actually makes the case that we need to recognize. The call to recognize Black Lives Matter in the middle of a pandemic is a call to recognize the original sin 
of the United States, racism. In the United States, we are learning now to recognize that black lives matter. Their campaign is a call to recognition, a wake up call to America that has too long overlooked like the priest and Levite racial inequalities in healthcare, education, and in the arts. We have overlooked racial profiling like Dives has, like the goats. We have overlooked excessive force by police or mass incarceration by law enforcement. We have overlooked the overall accommodation of white supremacy in our own culture. Our culture is a racist one and it's coming up with greater and greater frequency. And because of that, we have overlooked the way that black lives are lived in the United States. We have long overlooked the shooting of black men, for instance, as the priest and Levite overlooked the man on the road or as Dives overlooked Lazarus. Black Lives Matter is effectively a clarion call that white America has politically neglected the physical and often deadly assault on black lives by police and by white supremacists. The protests are shocking precisely because the protest is <clears throat> one to awaken in us a recognition of the situation. Thus in Rochester, for instance, naked protesters became naked and sat and were shackled with spit hoods, calling attention to the vulnerability of Daniel Prude, who was murdered while only covered by a hood by those charged with protecting us. A woman named Katie Walker Grimes wants us to recognize not only that Black Lives Matter, but the consistent and pervasive violence of unrecognized white supremacy remains. She insists that we recognize in our churches where we pray. She writes, since the racially segregated space of the United States operates as a habitat of white supremacy, the vice of white supremacy pervades the church's corporate body and thereby permeates all of its practices, including those of baptism and of Eucharist. If Grimes finds in Catholic parishes racism, and white supremacy, she can certainly find it in Catholic universities. In the United States, we have begun a recognition, for instance, a call to recognition by being called to remember the names. The, remembering the names is an act of recognition. We remember the name of George Floyd. We remember the name of Breonna Taylor. We remember the name of Ahmad Arbery. We remember the name of Trayvon Martin. We remember the name of Rodney King. We remember the name of Emmett Till and so many more victims of American racism. We need to engage in a corrective practice that stops overlooking but rather engages in deliberate recognition. That recognition helps us grow in vulnerability. The two go hand in hand. So as to see how vulnerability and recognition go together, I propose for us the parable of the prodigal son. Now, if we use that old fashioned understanding of vulnerability as being in need, we might think of the prodigal son as the vulnerable one, but hopefully this evening, we will think of vulnerability as being capacious to respond like the Good Samaritan. And therein, we will look to the vulnerability of the father of the prodigal son as being the vulnerable one at the center of the parable. The father is the vulnerable one who recognizes his son in the distance, rushes to him, embraces him, welcomes him, and thus begins the process of incorporating him, reconciling him, and accompanying him. But the story continues. The vulnerable father knows that as soon as he runs toward his younger son, he will trigger the resentfulness of his privileged son. We tend to think that the father is surprised by the older son's resentfulness, but that's silly. That's not true at all. He is too familiar with both of his sons. The father is vulnerable to both and knows that as soon as he goes to the younger son, the older one will be triggered in his resentfulness, but he wants the older son to learn recognition. The older son says, that's son of yours, but the father calls to him to recognize your brother 
was dead. Until the older one recognized his, brother, his younger brother, he remains invulnerable and unable to relate. The end of that parable leaves us with the challenges of accompaniment. Accompanying those on the margins triggers resentfulness from the privilege. When we march in support of, when white people, for instance, march in support of Black Lives Matter, we know we trigger resentfulness in many privileged people. We must be though like the father, not surrendering, surrendering to the terms of the privileged older brother, but in helping the privileged ones to recognize that in fact, black lives matter. Often enough, we are held hostage by the possibility of encountering the wrath of privileged resentfulness. Unlike the father, we do not run to respond. We do not know whether to, we want to unsettle the privilege, the supremacists, the relatives, the white community. We might be vulnerable, we might even recognize, but we hesitate to accompany because we are harnessed by the expected repercussions. So these three steps are the stuff of following Christ, to be vulnerable, to recognize the neighbor, and to accompany the other. Deeply in interconnected, we grow in one as we grow in the others. That third step, however, is not simply to accompany the marginalized. It also involves the responsibility, and this is what we can do on our campuses, to help the ones perplexed by what we do. Like the prodigal father, we cannot let the older one walk away. Son, he calls the elder one. Vulnerable to the son in need, the father remains vulnerable to the one unsettled. Like him, we cannot simply walk away from those who do not recognize. We need to call them to it. Still, though, we have to respond to both. We need to remember that the father did not hesitate to accompany the son whom he recognized on the horizon. And that's the step assuredly we cannot miss. We cannot fail to recognize that black lives matter. In short, I return to the beginning. We see that our colleges and universities grow as ethical when they grow as community. When faculty recognize greater opportunity to break out of their isolated worlds, when departments overcome their silos, when we on our campuses are vulnerable to one another, and when in the pandemic, we recognize the inequity of our world and work to resolve it. And when we hear the summons of those who call us to recognize that Black Lives Matter, the pandemic has revealed to us uh, to see and respond to reality as it is. But permit me two closing final words. When we finally begin to assume our vulnerability by humbly recognizing and responding to our world as it is, only then, will we begin to see rightly the goals we need to set for human progress. I, I wanna say here that as we begin to respond to Black Lives Matter, we have a heck of a lot much more to learn about racism. We, we're just getting a glimpse of it. I just read uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book on caste, The Origins of Our Discontent, a brilliant book. But there are so many books like this that are out there, that are there for us to understand the situation once we begin the process of recognition. When we begin that work, we will begin to see how much our world is shaped by structural injustice and how much it humiliates those whom we are just learning to recognize. I think as we begin to understand more and more the campaign of Black Lives Matter, we will grow a knowledge of just how pervasive, just how violent and just how racist our country is. In a way, COVID-19, by exposing the evil of inequities, is just giving us a glimpse of what is wrong with the world. When we begin to see a right, we will begin to see the world as it is, experienced by many who do, whom we do not yet recognize. And that leads me to the closing point. These last four years with President Donald Trump taught me, at least, that we were not as a nation as progressive as I thought we were. But only now I recognize that neither am I, and I confess that here. I recently wrote a major article for theological studies that comes out next week entitled The Color Line, Race and Caste, The Politics of Neglect and the Ethics of Recognition. At the end of it, I noted that though I have written and taught on theological ethics for more than 35 years, I failed to adequately recognize that I should write much more on racism. 
I apologized for leaving it to others to do. I want also to acknowledge that others have patiently brought me to this point. I didn't get here without any number of people. I, one of my colleagues is Sean Copeland, who has called me to this point fairly often. To understand that there is much to do to help America be more vulnerable and to recognize that Black Lives Matter against the background of racist America. This pandemic, Black Lives Matter, and my colleagues have awakened me out of my self-complacency to a new vulnerability. I hope for you, as you consider our structures of racism in America, that you too, especially if you belong to that privileged class, recognize that it is time for decentering, engaging vulnerability, and building a new agenda wherein we learn from others whom we have dominated. I will try to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Keenan, for that exceptional and moving um, and powerful and enlightening uh, lecture, um, a genuine tour de force. Thank you so very much. We now have the opportunity to engage directly with our distinguished speaker. Please feel free to submit your questions for Professor Keenan in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you please avoid using the chat box to submit questions. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Q&A moderator for this evening, Dr. Michael McGravey, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Institute for Theology and Pastoral Study. Thank you, Dr. DiPergola. <clears throat> Let me extend my thanks to Father Keenan for an excellent evening and presentation. As a graduate of the Canisius High School of Buffalo, New York, it's always a joy and a challenge to learn from another Jesuit. So I welcome our guest questions for Father Keenan. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question, if I may. Uh, many in our society and on our campuses might believe that social media is a way to respond, maybe their form of vulnerability, but the direct action is missing. For example, Boulder's violence this week or the mass shooting in Atlanta have not been met with action but with angry, confused, frustrated tweets and posts. And meanwhile, our politicians invite prayer versus passing policy or law. My question is this, how do we encourage our students to embrace vulnerability, especially when we have witnessed a summer's worth of victimization and punishment that encourages retreat to siloed arenas of thought and familiarity and unwillingness to be vulnerable in conversation with those outside our silos? or our political beliefs. <clears throat> Oops, you're muted, sorry. Uh, I, I think that it's really rather a central question. First, I think social media is, is, a, is like, it's not like a college age student yet. Um, it, it's before that, we're talking about a development and maturation that we don't know yet how to use it. I think many of us think that if I hit that like button, I'm suddenly on board in, in this issue of recognition, uh, that I'm suddenly vulnerable. Um, and that's why I think that with Black Lives Matter, we're challenged to something much more long lasting than that. Um, and I think we have to work out um, in our communities, the way we actually encourage one another to move forward. I think, I think also that um, I'm concerned with, as the vaccines are rolling out, how quickly people are trying to get to the new normal. And we see, for instance, all around the world that people are not getting vaccinated, but we know we are. And, and, and we feel that relief. And of course that should happen, but I'm concerned about whether or not we're really going to learn anything from the past 14 months. Um, I was struck. I, I was, I'm, I'm 68 years old. I've had two cancers um, and I actually am teaching in class. I'm a Jesuit, it's a Jesuit university. So all of us Jesuits decided we were gonna teach in class. We could uh, apply for an accommodation to teach virtually, but we decided to teach in class. We didn't do it collectively, we did it individually. And then we found out we all had taken the same position. But I, 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 am, I, I am very mindful of how much I protected myself. I've now been vaccinated. I was just now with people 
uh, from my family. Um, I've been double vaccinated and I was socializing with them. I hadn't seen them for more than a year and the CDC said I could see them. And so I did. Um, I felt so uncomfortable when I got hugged by them. I was like, ah, you shouldn't be doing that because for a year, I kept myself protected by the fears that I had of contracting it. And I had that. And I realized how deep my fear was. And I'd been contrasting it with the marches of Black Lives Matter, that, that groups of people who were among those most at risk to the virus decided they had to get out into the streets and make a protest. That act of rage over the death of George Floyd, over Breonna Taylor, over Aubrey and a variety of other names, um, Purdue, um, all of these, what did it take to get involved in those marches? And, and so there's a certain way that we have to introduce, I think, uh, 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 some sort of way that we challenge ourselves with whether we're actually conning ourselves with thinking that we're on board. I think we have to ask, are we really on board? What does it take to show me that I am really on board? I'd say that if you belong to a race of people who've really been um, overlooked and you're at the highest risk and then you march because one of your brothers has been murdered. Um, that, that's the lessons that we need to be taught. So I don't think we're gonna be able to figure out how we are genuinely suspicious of ourselves. I think we need to let black lives uh, interrogate us, uh, put us on the spot, prompt us to think uncomfortably about whether we're doing enough. Like my colleague, Sean Copeland, She's managed to provoke me enough times. She didn't give up on me. I think that's important. Thank you. Uh, one of the other questions we received was, how do, you, how do we attend to the vulnerability of those who wonder how a loving God could allow something like COVID-19 or the senseless killing of people of color? Mm. Yeah, I, I just don't, <laughs> I believe that God is vulnerable. You know, I think that the death of Jesus, the, the great story of the death of Jesus is for us to appreciate what God really is and who God really is. We really need to understand that. Most, most people who work in ethics will talk about the death of Jesus because that death keeps us from saying to ourselves that God is a rescuer and God just intervenes and God controls everything. But God seems much more to be accompanying, to be part of the solution rather than the great solver. And, 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 he, and God does that by, by accompanying. I always think that a meditation is to consider Christ dying on the cross and, his, and, and what the Father is like as the Son dies. I think capturing, capturing the, the grief of God as, as Jesus dies on the cross is a way of appreciating uh, the vulnerability of God. I think once we stop with notions of power and turn more to vulnerability, we learn about the pathways that we can go forward to construct things not out of the way we wish things were, but the way things are. So between vulnerability and power of God, I'll take the vulnerability. Thank you. In a related question, uh, one of our, our guests asks, how do we reconcile the two concepts of one, the idea that Black Lives Matter, which is true, and two, the group Black Lives Matter, which is openly Marxist and atheist? Yeah, I, I, I think that I'm not trying to say that any movement is itself free of anything. If anything you've gotten from my talk tonight is I love complexity. You know, so I'm invited to give a university ethics thing that will talk about how universities can be solvers of the solution. And I spend half the talk as a, as a way of wakening up the university to say, I don't think you have all the answers. So, I, I mean, I, I'd say that the same way, but I, I would say that Black Lives Matter is giving, even, even in the mar most Marxist moments, Probably, and I'm not saying that they have Marxist moments. The, the questioner is saying that. 
I think Black Lives Matter has a variety of different incarnations and social media plays out a variety of those, both pro and con. It's a complex issue, but I would say that there's a lot to learn from Black Lives Matter. There's a lot to learn from those who espouse it. I don't think anybody is looking for a orthodoxy uh, tape. I think what we're talking about it rather is a conscious movement of awareness that we have not thought that Black Lives Matter. And that's what we have to remember. We have not thought that Black Lives Matter. That's why we were not disturbed when George Floyd is killed right in front of people there as this police officer does it. If, if this was a white person, we, it, that would not have happened that way. So there's a certain way that what we have to, there's so much that we have to learn that if we start worrying about the orthodoxy of a particular degree of a particular movement, we're, we're looking at a tree without looking at the forest that is actually standing there in protest saying, where are you? So there are two questions here uh, relating to the start of your talk um, uh, in talking about education. So the first, uh, your, mark, your remarks highlight a gap in higher education administration programs, courses in university ethics. If there were such courses in higher education administration programs, how do you think they would help faculty and administrators form better communities? Right. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, de I deliberately go after faculty when I speak on this. I don't go after administrators, but to give an instance, um, many universities, we faculty know who shows up for office hours and who doesn't. We don't say anything about that. We, we may occasionally say, mutter something to the, to the dean, uh, to the chairman or chairwoman, but we normally don't. There's a certain way we keep our blind design. The question of recognizing different things that are going on. Or we could see students who are waiting outside an office of where a faculty member is not going to arrive. I just use that as an example to say that there's a lot of things that we could do that we don't do because we like our cubicles. And, and I, I guess I would suggest that getting the faculty to realize that maybe they don't have, well, I have, uh, there are a number of universities that use my book to begin to say how on their campuses they have not recognized a variety of different structural issues that keep them from collaborating with one another toward becoming a more ethical place. So I think that the answer requires, you know, a willingness to entertain the question and to begin to ask questions about race, about gender. I do a, a question, right? Most of our universities now are about 54% um, female and uh, an undergraduate population of 46% male. Uh, that's a general uh, average, but clearly it's, um, uh, it's a, a big divide. And then if you ask how many of the administration, of the senior administration are women, how many of the faculty have leadership positions? Right now, I've, I'm on a gender equity committee. We have found that during COVID-19, the people who were most stressed in trying to do virtual teaching and in line were those who had care responsibilities. And again, they're overwhelmingly women. And women faculty member around the world, I've done two committees, international committees, that women are just saying they're not able to keep up with the call to research and other things because of COVID and yet they find themselves in the same position that women were 20 years ago. The university doesn't see that having children belongs to a question of the university. We leave that question as a private question. But in other countries, I'm in a, an alliance with another uh, couple of schools. We had a discussion about what are the policies on our campus. So we have a, we have a school for about 50 kids and they have to be three years or older. Um, in one of my companion schools in, in Chile, Santiago, Chile, every, every child of every faculty, uh, administrator and staff uh, has a place in their facility. We have 50 slots. They have it for everyone and not from three, but from six months. Um, so there's a lot for us to, if we would start looking around our university with critical eyes, using COVID as an experience to say, what's out of sync? 
I think we start to see that it's part the university itself and it's in part the way the faculty act that doesn't help the matter. Thank you. Uh, Sister Deirdre Griffin, a sister of St. Joseph here, who signs her question with a uh, BC law graduate class of ah, good. And a uh, former Jesuit volunteer asks this, colleges, quote, grow as ethical when we grow in community, end quote. I yeah. experienced this happening among us at Elms as we engage the work we need to do regarding anti-racism more consciously. I firmly believe that this is possible because of our vulnerability to COVID. We have been led to gather in new ways that level the space, Zoom and smaller groups, and allow for deepening relationship. Our Zoom gathering today in solidarity with our AAPI sisters and brothers was a sacred example of this. How can we intentionally tend this leaven going forward mm. among all facets of our community as we move toward a next, quote unquote, new normal? Can we choose to resist the rush to return to, a, to our overly committed busyness in our silos? Yeah, I think, I think we have to look around and to see who's returning to the normal and who can't. I think if we start doing that, I had a custodian here tell me all the difficulties he's getting access to find access to um, the, the vaccines. He doesn't have a computer to get online to do this contact and he's trying to figure these things out. I think we need to look around and see that it's somebody that we've just been talking to that is not returning to the new normal. And as a matter of fact, all the news shows us that around the world, there's no return to the new normal. There's something happening here and there's something that's happening in a wonderful way. I mean, I don't want to deny that it's wonderful to see the rollout of the vaccines in this country, but I would like to see it more equitably. I would like to see it with greater access. And I would like to see, I would also like to see some Americans paying attention to the common good and get the vaccine because they're trying to help other people rather than they're afraid of getting it. And it's like, we have too much individualism in this country and we have to have a greater appreciation of the common good. So I would say if we keep looking around at who's being left behind, we'll see some of the problems that we need to address. Um, they're in the newspapers every day. Your response here sparked a question that's not fully formed yet, but yeah. I was thinking of Dan Haran's uh, Franciscan. Oh, I know Dan, I taught him. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, yeah, um, from Catholic uh, Theological Union now. Right. Um, he recently wrote in the National Catholic Reporter about the new normal for church. And mm -hmm. you know, I, th I think this is a very important question that um, we are going to have. Our church, our faith communities are very communal centered. And any sense of return to normal, Dan argues, is going to be a challenge. We have many folks who have shopped online for churches rather than attending, you know, their neighborhood church or their right. or whatever the diocese would tell them is their local um, center of faith. So can you speak to that? Can you speak to how uh, the church is going to be challenged as well with this new normal? Yeah, I, I think it's going to take time. There's something that happens. Like I, I mentioned that experience of having my sister hug me and my brother-in-law uh, welcomed me and my grandnephew and grandniece want to hold on to me. And I'm thinking, boy, this is great. And I'm also thinking this is uncomfortable. This is really new. I think that we'll find in the future that we'll miss, you know, there's um, Yates, is it Yates uh, traveling to Bethlehem um, in search of Bethlehem? He talks about um, the, the wise men, the, uh, the journey of the Magi. They're, they're, they're looking to find the star and, and they're, they're so hopeful that they're gonna see the star. And when, once they get to Bethlehem, they see utter vulnerability, poverty. They see a child in a manger. What they were expecting was to find a king. They find a virgin who's 16. They find a, a man who's not the father. They find all this. And, and then they realized that they had a hard trip and how difficult it was. And, and now they return to their kingdoms where everything is wonderful. And they start longing for that time when they encountered something real. I hope that, I hope that we realize that these are holy moments we've been in. That 
that like for me, I mean, I wrote this article, I spent most of it working on this big piece to say, I have to understand about race because I could not get over these men and women going out and protesting. If, they, if their rage was that bad, I was not seeing something. And then I keep seeing day in and day out how I don't see what they've seen or experienced. So I, I, I think it's, it's good. We, we, we see this experience that people who've been kidnapped realize that there was something that happened. If people who've been hostage realize that they learned something. And that's what we've been through uh, in a more, it depends on the, the wealth and the s securities that we have. But um, I think that there's, I, I don't want to romanticize it, but I do want to say that sometimes when there aren't other distractions, there's a revelation that can occur about what really counts in life. And I'd say that's key. I have a question for you. Sure. When were you at uh, uh, the uh, Kenesha's High? Now I'm gonna age myself, uh, 1997 to 2001. Oh, oh yeah. I figured you were much, actually you're much uh, uh, younger than I thought um, because I taught there for three years. Oh, okay. Um, uh, that's not in my, it is in my CV, but my CV is long, but I taught there from 79 to 82. So it's kind of, I was standing here thinking, no, from 76 to 79. So I was sitting, standing here thinking to myself, did I teach you too? But uh, uh, you look too, you look too young to be somebody I would have taught. Perhaps uh, uh, Jim Van Dyke or Jack Matamore. Yeah, uh, I taught them. I taught uh, Van Dyke and, and Matamore I know very well. So uh, thank you. Um, all right, the question, the next question, how should we interact and respect the dignity of those who don't believe COVID-19 is real or that we don't have a systematic problem with racism in the country? We have a real problem in our country. We still know that there, there's up to like 25% who do not believe that the election was settled. You know, think of that. We certainly have more than 25% who do not believe that Black Lives Matter. I mean, Black people know that, but we whites, we don't know that. And we're, they're, they're, we, ha, we white people have to pay attention to these discrepancies. And, and it's not like shouting at people, but we, that was my point about the uh, older brother and the way the pro father, the prodigal son, tries to help the older brother understand that that is his brother. It's not just his son, it's his brother that he has to understand. So I think that we have a, we have a double responsibility, not only to respond to African-Americans, to Asian-Americans, to Latinos, to, to queer people, to a variety of people who don't have as much uh, of the stability and benefits that many of us do have, but we also have to address that part of ours our, our, our families, our neighborhoods, our populations that are the older brother, that are, that are nothing but able to judge the worth of the other negatively and are unable to see their responsibility to that other. He sees nothing, nothing, not a grain of anything that should happen to his younger brother. That is a typical stance that we see even today. When a person says, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna wear a mask. I, I'm always astonished. I do say to people, where's your mask? Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I just wonder how many people in our American culture do not realize that we are created by a God who made us for one another. And, and, and I just don't understand. So that 25%, don't believe the election or 25% don't think the storming of the Capitol was, was an insurrection or that, um, you know, 35% uh, think that, well, all lives matter. Um, it, it goes on, but the resistance to insight, to recognition in our country is an enduring problem. I'll add this. One thing we don't do in this, I've written on this quite a bit. And if you wanna read an article of mine uh, that I would say, you wanna see what I really think? It's an American magazine. It's called The Arrested Development of the American Conscience. Don't worry, I'll only go on for one minute, I promise. The Arrested Development of the American Conscience. In it, 
I note that unlike other countries, the United States is incapable of apologizing for what they've done. Some other countries like Japan also has that difficulty. But if you go around Germany, for instance, you will find memorials to the Holocaust, you'll find memorials to the, to the Romans, to the gypsies, you'll find it to homosexuals, you'll find an acknowledgement by the Germans of what they did in the war. And you will find that in many different countries. There is nothing that we have in the United States that acknowledges what we did with slavery. Our history of slavery is not acknowledged anywhere, nor is there an apology for it. We can talk about it as an original sin, but you know, the only thing we have right now, oh, thank you. The only thing we have right now is a, um, you know, the lynching memorial by Brian Stevenson, a, a black man who made us look at lynching, but there's no apology by the US government. If you wanted to find out about the extermination of the people on the, on the Navajo trails, on the Trail of Tears, you, you will find a sign saying, this is the Trail of Tears, but you will not find anywhere that the United States has apologized. So even when Obama goes to Hiroshima and he's standing there, that he can't apologize. The US will not allow an apology. And until we start apologizing, we're never going to be open to the truth. I know in my own life as a teacher, I remember I had a class one day that, God, I didn't handle it right. I got a question and a student really treated me with disrespect and I decided to show her that I was, you know, in charge. And, and I, I wasn't brutal, I was just rude. And I, I apologized, I couldn't get over what I had done, but I had done it. And, and then I realized that I must do, I must have that in myself. So I acknowledge and apologize to that class. But I find myself that I have to apologize. I think, I think we need training lessons in the United States of watching somebody apologize for a moment, just to understand what that could look like. You know, like if the governor of New York could apologize, maybe things would change. You know, I mean, I could go on with a litany here, but let's start with slavery. Let's apologize for slavery. Let's acknowledge that we, from 1619, managed to treat others as chattel and, and what that really meant. That's what we're seeing with some of my schools like Georgetown and, and what the Jesuits are owning up to. But we, we need to own up to our histories. And when we do, we need to apologize. And if we start apologizing, maybe that will teach other people that they need to at least recognize before they even get to the capacity to apologize. Thank you. Uh, one other question. Um, I am willing to be vulnerable as the Good Samaritan. How can I work with those who are unwilling to be vulnerable? How can we break down those barriers? I don't know, we find opportunities. I always try, like I try with, you know, I mean, one of the great things that we, one of the great things that we have in our country is an appreciation of family. You know, so everybody was talking over the past couple of years, what was Thanksgiving like? Um, we, we've noticed something. I think one thing is helpful. One lesson is helpful. The United States has handled better than other countries. I know some people will really object. So I, I wanna put in all the caveats that I should, but just say, I know that they're there. But there's been a coming out process that we've seen in families that, that maybe, maybe our hierarchy doesn't understand it, but, but, but certainly many families understand that when a family member comes out, there is um, greater possibility of reconciliation, I think today, than there was 25 years ago. We have started a process of, by coming out of, of getting more reconciled on this and becoming more familiar. We're learning more and more. And now the transgender question is in front of us and people are trying to tell their narrative. And there's, I'm not saying there's sufficient tolerance in any way, but there is a growing tolerance and there's something that we're doing, and I'll say this, I think that the homosexual question in the United States has advanced because people came out to their families. They needed the family to know, you know what they were, and they needed the family to accept them or not, but at least that they needed to tell them. I think that that, that coming out um, is important and can be a model for talking about how we see racism or how we see a failure to respect the common good. That, that if we could uh, articulate better 
our anguish over this issue, we would do better. I think the model of those who came out is, is, is helpful to say that unlike other issues in the United States, that one seems to have been, and maybe that's because it doesn't, that's not color or oriented, but that one and class oriented, that one has uh, been affected by the fact that the way people became open to the question was when they realized the family member was gay or lesbian or transgender. Thank you. Uh, one final question for, for Father Keenan this evening. How does the university, the Elms, move forward to become more like the father of the prodigal son, someone who takes responsibility to help others learn to recognize the neighbor in need as he did with his older son? And this person adds to assist students, faculty, and staff in learning to be vulnerable and gain the ability to recognize is, is what uh, this person's focused on. Yeah, that, that's a great question to close on. I would say that these are great models, right? The, the Good Samaritan parable is, I, I didn't do this in the paper, but the Good Samaritan parable was always this story. It was always taught this way. And I'll leave this as another way of leaving a story with people. The Good Samaritan parable was preached from the fourth century to the 16th century in this way. The man on the road is Adam who's been wounded by sin and death. He has just left the city. He's left Eden. He's wounded by sin and, and death. And he's, follow, he's passed by the priest and the Levite, the law and the, and the text. And they are unable to do anything for him. And then one not from here, uh, the Samaritan, the Christ, is able to respond and, 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 and cleans his wounds, which is a beginning of our salvation, which is salvus, the cleaning of the wounds then takes him to an inn where he makes a deposit of two denarii, which are the two commandments. But he leaves it with the innkeeper, who's Peter, and the inn is the church. And he tells him that he will come back and bring him to his home, which is the kingdom. The parable was always taught first as the gospel in miniature, that the, that the story is really paying attention to that good Samaritan and what he has done for me. I think when, like what I tried to do tonight, I tried to tell you what I'm learning along the way. I think that when we start telling that we don't have all the answers, the university could learn to do that. When the university starts talking about what it's trying to learn, what it's trying to do rather than what it's accomplished. If, if we in ourselves as faculty are more open about our struggles and showing what we're trying to get, we can drop the veneer of having all the answers and we can show how we're touched by these processes. So the Good Samaritan parable was told not to imitate Christ, but to first see what he did for me. And if we get that lesson right, we will know how to imitate Christ. So the call to be merciful is the acknowledgement that we've been treated with mercy. And I think that, you know, like I'm very grateful to Sean and I'm grateful to lots of people who've like, like the students who were really angry at me for the way I was rude to this student, um, that helped me. And, and I think we need to be more honest about how we're helped along the way. Humanity, we have to be vulnerable human beings. Well, on, on behalf of Elms, I'd like to add my thanks before turning it back to Peter. Uh, it's been a wonderful night and I'm glad that we were able to hear such a, a fantastic lecture. Thank you. It's been a privilege coming. Um, a friend, um, one of my housemates is Andrea Vicini, and he's worked with Peter. And so he's been telling me all about Elms for the past couple of weeks. So just so you know. Thank you, Dr. McGravey, for moderating that interactive session. And of course, uh, to you, Professor Keenan, for your, um, as always, brilliant insights. On behalf of the St. Augustine Center for Ethics, Religion, and Culture, please join me in thanking Professor Keenan again for his exceptional insight on these timely and pressing issues. Uh, Professor Keenan, we are all in your debt this evening, and we look forward to inviting you back to speak in person at some point in the yeah, future. That'd be nice. As a reminder, tonight's inaugural Distinguished Lecture in Ethics has been recorded and will be available on the Elms College YouTube channel within the next 
few days. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.